Uh, well, welcome. Yeah. Sorry, welcome to Mark School Number Eight, and this is the second. Can you hear me? This is the second English language discussion. The first one was by Michael Roberts from London, and today we have. Dr. Eduardo Tatum is a convener program of on alternative development, University of the Philippines Center for Integrative and Development Studies. And he was also a retired professor of Asian Studies, University of Penis, University of Philippines, Dilmen. Today he talks about Marxism and the disappearing peasantry. So without further ado, I ask Tatum to make his presentation 40 to 60 minutes, and then we can have a discussion on this very important subject. Thanks, Ted, Ed, uh, for accepting the invitation. So it's for you now. Okay, uh, let me just share my screen now. Thank you very much, Sumame. Uh, but before I start, maybe I just need to make some clarifications. This uh, lecture was presented two years ago uh, when the University of the Philippines Center for Integrative and Development Studies organized a series of lectures to commemorate the 200th uh, birthday of Karl Marx. Uh, and uh, I was one of those who presented. And I, I presented this basically it's this same paper. So to those who had listened at that time, that was a face-to-face -face meeting, of course. Um, so there's not much difference from this. But the, the other disclosure is that mo most of my thoughts and ideas here was actually reflected in my PhD dissertation uh, at the National University of Singapore on Southeast Asian Studies about 15 years ago. So it's quite some time. And uh, so perhaps... Uh, Perhaps it probably needs uh, updating more analysis based on what has been uh, done since then in agrarian studies. Although the basic debates and the basic issues probably remain the same, which I will go into. Okay, uh, so might as well start. This is my uh, lecture outline. I just a brief introduction, and then uh, before I go directly into the issue of uh, the so-called disappearing peasantry, I need to to do some background backgrounder to why this issue is uh, is something that is being debated on. So I will first talk about the nature of peasant society. And then number two, the it should be number three. Sorry about the numbering. Mode of the mode of production issue and an old old issue which I'm trying to revive in um, as a way of focusing on this issue of the peasantry. And then I will look into the issue of the peasantry as a class, which is again also a, a you know an issue that's being debated among scholars of agrarian studies. Does the peasantry constitute a class or is it, is it just a subclass and so forth and so on. And then I will go into the meat of the lecture, which is uh, the issue of the disappearing peasantry, but in the context of uh, changes in the agrarian sector, primarily in developing societies. And then from there, I move into move to uh, more contemporary and recent information and data. So these next two parts are, are quite new. So looking at the global picture of family farms in the world today. And then uh, lastly, look at the current Philippine setting of uh, the issue of the peasantry and family farms. Okay, uh, classical Marxist analysis points to the eventual disappearance of the peasantry. 
within the context of capitalist development as new productive forces based on modern large-scale agriculture sweep aside the old pre-capitalist mode and render smallholder farming redundant. Other writers, however, of the, of the same Marxist uh, bent argue that what actually happens is that there comes about a dependent relationship between the two farming modes, the capitalist mode as well as the smallholder mode in terms of the provision of surplus labor and the responsibility for reproducing labor power. Thus, far from disappearing, peasant society exhibits a resilience that persists through time. Today, the latter view appears to have prevailed as the UNFAO reports that 90% of the world's farms continue to be family run, um, smallholder types. So probably reports of the demise of the peasantry have been quite premature. A central issue with respect to agrarian studies is the persistence and resilience of a small peasant milieu despite the many years of inter interaction with various external political and economic forces and, and even the resulting material transformation among the residents. Uh, okay, so let's now go into the nature of peasant society. I don't know if you're familiar with this guy, Alexander Chayanov. Uh, there are two major traditions in peasant uh, in uh, studies on peasant society. Uh, one is the school of the essentialists, and the other school is known as the non-essentialists. Now, the debates between these two camps took on an accelerated pace during the period of the 1960s and the 1970s, when, after a hiatus of 30 years, Peasant studies experience a resurgence, and one of the most influential factors that brought about the resurgence of peasant studies at this time was the uh, release of the English translation of Alexander Vasilievich Chayanov's The Theory of Peasant Society, written in 1925, but uh, for a long time was lost, but was rediscovered in the 1960s, and in 1966, an English translation came about. Now, what what Chayanov did was to develop a theory of peasant behavior at the level of individual family farms that gave rise to an economy with its own growth dynamic and economic system and driven by subsistence needs rather than by profit. On the other hand, uh, no sorry, Bernstein and Byers in 2001, pointed to the originality and distinctiveness of Chayanov's work in making a claim for the peasant economy as a general and generic type, almost like a mode of production in itself, and of the peasant household as both a unitary farming enterprise and the site of biological reproduction. So this peasant essentialist school takes off from Chayanov's analysis and together with sociological and culturalist conceptions, is constructed around the various qualities of peasantness as represented by the following factors. Number one, household farming, organized for simple reproduction, in other words, subsistence. Number two, the solidarities, reciprocities, and egalitarianism of village community. And number three, a commitment to the values of a way of life based on household and community, kin and local. And more important, feeling of harmony with nature. Peasants are contrasted with proletarians on one hand and market-oriented and entrepreneurial farmers on the other. The core elements of peasant society, household, kinship, community, local, produce or express a distinctive internal logic or dynamic, whether this be cultural, sociological, economic, or in combination of any of these three uh, factors. Now the relations of peasants with external groups, such as landlords, large capitalist farms, merchants, the state, and urban forces, are marked by subordination and exploitation. Now that is granted. But these relations lie outside the sphere of the essence of peasant society. For Chayanov, peasants form an independent class with the logic of their peasantness virtually unchanging, while the forms of their external relations 
with landlords, big farms, and merchants, and the state uh, are variable and contingent. Now, Chayanov's view contradicts classical orthodox Marxist theory. By centering the peasant economy in the family household, where both production and reproduction take place, peasant essentialism takes issue with this orthodox Marxist view that the peasant economy is nothing more than an incipient form of capitalism or a form of incipient capitalism represented by petty commodity production. Now, what about the non-essentialists, the other school? The non-essentialists deny that the concept of a specific peasant mode of production can be gleaned from Chayanov's or from any other essentialist school. Marxist scholar Hamza Alavi, for example, pointed out that peasants were found in a variety of pre-capitalist modes of production, and they also operate within the capitalist mode of production, which has spread globally and dissolved pre-capitalist modes of production virtually everywhere in the world. Bernstein and Byers, on the other hand, 2001, sees the work of the non-essentialists as consisting in using alternative approaches to analysis of agrarian structure and change based on a materialist political economy of agrarian structure and change. Um, so non-essentialists look at three things. Peasants in different modes of production, whether this be feudal, capitalist, slave, Asiatic mode of production, peasants are always there. And two, there is class differentiation among peasants. In other words, it's not a homogeneous class. I will go into that later. And then, of course, linkages of peasant production to wage labor. In other words, the, they're not just uh, household based, they are not just. Uh, subsistence oriented, they do employ wage labor, and some of them even undertake wage labor. Mari? Theodore Shanin, on the other hand, uh, apologies for this photograph, uh, chose me with Theodore Shanin, <laughs> back in 2017, uh, in of all places, Beijing. And behind us, you will notice uh, a photo of uh, June Boras, He's the editor of the Journal of Peasant Studies today, a Filipino agrarian scholar. But anyway, Theodore Shenin, who, by the way, uh, unfortunately passed away just a few months ago, actually agrees with the essentialists, but not totally, because he adds a number of concepts that nuances the position of the essentialists. Number one, peasant farms are multidimensional. Uh, they do utilize family labor, but they are not isolated. As what Chayanov had tried to point out, they are involved in exchange. They are involved in markets. They sell their produce in the market. But uh, land husbandry is the main means of livelihood. But they have this specific and socially determined cultural patterns of us versus them. But he agrees with Chayanov that the domination by outsiders is undertaken through subjugation and exploitation. But they do have this distinct uh, modes of resistance, uh, which are more self-defense types of resistance, uh, called weapons of the weak, everyday resistance. And these two concepts, of course, were developed by the noted Yale University Agrarian scholar, scholar uh, James Scott, Weapons of the Week and Everyday Forms of Peasant Resistance, together with uh, Benedict Kirklit. And then, of course, the issue of full-fledged, full-scale class-based uh, revolts. Now let's go to the mode of production issue. Karl Marx, <coughs> uh, by the way, Shane in, Shanin uh, avoids, avoids the use of this uh, mode of production concept. He does not think it's relevant as far as looking at uh, peasant society is concerned. But I, I would think that the MOP concept, the mode of production concept, if used in a different sense than what it has been used so far by traditional Marxists, is relevant and useful in looking at peasant societies. 
according to Dergen Ray, Marx often used the term peasant mode of production. He did use the term in several instances. I will show later you know, where, where he did this. Um, but the problem is that Marx never gave a precise and exclusive definition of mode of production. He never really pointed out oh, the mode of production is this. And so that would have silenced any other debate that came later. Um, but he, he did, he, he used it in several senses. Uh, one, he used it as a manner or mode of material production. Now, this is what we are most familiar with. In other words, the relationship with the, uh, the uh, confluence of relations of production and forces of production make up the mode of production. We're familiar with this. But he also looked at it as a concrete historical object, something that has, uh, of course, occurred through history. But then he also used it in an abstract and analytical model. In other words, something that doesn't really exist in the real world. And then lastly, uh, and this is quite, quite interesting, he also used the term mode of production to refer to the broad organization of society. In other words, encompassing all social relations, economic, political, uh, ideological, and so forth and so on. Now, if one, you know, just for the sake of debate, take Marx's view of mode of production as a broad organization society, this would be quite convenient because this would partially refute the charge that Marx is an eco economic determinist, that he only looked at uh, the economic factor as the basis of everything else in society. And that, that, and that really riled these critics and say, well, you're an economic determinist. Uh, a minute. Okay, so, but then this, this notion of mode of production as a broad organization of society also supports the essentialist view of peasant society. Chayanov plus, plus uh, Shenin and other scholars that came afterwards. And lastly, it enables one to ascribe to peasant society a unique and specific mode of production. So, but then Marx in uh, the, the, one of his most famous works, the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, wrote of peasants whose mode of production isolates them from one another and whose field of co-production, the smallholder, admits of no division of labor in its cultivation where each individual peasant family is almost self-sufficient, directly producing the major part of its consumption and thus acquires its means of livelihood more through exchange with nature than an intercourse with uh, society. Now, these are the instances in Marx's work where he referred to peasant economies and peasant societies as a mode of production. Capital, Volume 1, Chapter 32, uh, the International Publishers Edition, 1967, page 761. Capital, Volume 3, Chapter 47, Genesis of Capitalist Ground Rent. Again, the International Publishers Edition of 1967, page 807. And in 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte from the Moscow Publication Progress Publishers, Marx and Engels Selected Works, Volume 1, page 478. Now, the peasants can be found in various social formations dating from the early period of human history, meaning th tens of thousands of years ago, can be accounted for by uh, this concept, which I discovered several, about 20, 25 years ago, the concept of articulation and coexistence of modes of production. Uh, Wolf in 1980, 
defines the notion of articulation of modes of production as the relationship between the reproduction of the capitalist economy on the one hand and the reproduction of productive units organized according to pre-capitalist relations and forces of production on the other. In this instance, the capitalist mode is not always dominant and a situation could arise where pre-capitalist modes can even take on um, a primary role. Now, this is particularly relevant in underdeveloped uh, or developing societies in Asia, Africa, Latin America, where the colonial experience had resulted in the superimposition of capitalist modes on basically non-capitalist or pre-capitalist societies. A peasant-based society with its self-reproducing character and minimal needs provided a cheap, cheap workforce for labor-intensive capitalist enterprises thus enabling the latter, the capitalist uh, agro-enterprises, to, to extract super profits while bringing only the minimum capital investment requirements. To this functional role is added the provision of cheap food and raw materials for capitalism, which are produced on peasant economies, on peasant economic units at minimal cost uh, or no cost at all to the capitalist. So to summarize peasant society with its family-based labor, production for basic needs, in other words, use value, and not for profit, exchange value, kinship, social organizational patterns, uh, especially the notion of reciprocity, self-sufficiency and capacity to reproduce itself, the feeling of community, as Marx pointed out, in relation to external forces appropriating the farm surplus product, and exercising political hegemony over, uh, over the peasantry, that is, the distinct cultural forms that can, one can find in peasant society, which actually borders on a very spiritual type of uh, cultural form, cognitions and practices, in other words, their worldview, and uh, their persistence throughout human history. All of this point to what can be seen as a distinct and a relatively stable socio-economic system. Let's now look at the concept of the peasantry as a class. Now, in this instance, a similar all-inclusive standpoint is taken with respect to the concept of the peasantry as a class. Roseberry, 1983, pleads for a more inclusive notion of class to include not just production relations, but also the feeling of community. He contends that Marx did not see class in the mechanical way that many Marxists do, and that the formation of a feeling of community was basic to Marx's definition of a class. To support this, Roseberry uh, quotes Marx's famous passage on small peasant proprietors, again in the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte. In so far as millions of families live under economic conditions of existence that separate their mode of life, their interests, and their cultural formation from those of the other classes, they form a class. In so far as these small peasant propri proprietors are merely connected on a local basis, and the identity of their interests fail to produce a feeling of community, these are my uh, uh, emphasis, national links or a political organization, they do not form a class. Eric Hobsbawm, on the other hand, the uh, famous uh, historian, who was, uh, until the end of his life, a member of the British Communist Party, although he was a very heretical member, and uh, the party was always on the verge of expelling him, except that his reputation as a uh, as a uh, prominent world-renounced uh, historian prevented the party from breaking ties with Hobsbawm. But anyway, according to Hobsbawm, peasants as a class in is a class in and for itself. Uh, and that, that they have a higher degree of formal or informal collectivity. And that it would be difficult to conceive of a traditional peasantry without this collective element. Furthermore, in historical sense, in a historical sense for Hobsbawm, the peasant is not just a class in itself, but 
also exhibits the traits of a class for itself and that they had formed the greater part of humanity for the greater part of history and they have been always aware of their distinction from and almost their subalternity to their oppression by the minorities of non-peasants whom they never liked and never trusted." Unquote. While the peasantry may be a class of low classness and that peasant consciousness is somewhat vague, Hobsbawm nevertheless argues that having the kind of relation to the means of production as well as other common economic and social characteristics fulfill the function of evoking recognition and solidarity. In other words, peasant consciousness among, among peasants that transcends regions, dialects, costumes, and customs, and specific geographical limits. And that there is mutual recognition by peasants of the similarity of the relationship to nature, to production, and to non-peasants. <coughs> Back to Theodore Shenin. For Shenin, class can also be taken in a political sense as when peasants are driven by their common interests during crisis situations to engage in struggles with capitalist landowners, various groups of capital-related townsmen, and the state. No matter that these are often characterized by inescapable fragmentation into small local segments and the diversity and vagueness of their political aims, both of which serve to undermine their political impact. No matter, according to Shady, there's still a class. A final point on the myriad scope of uh, activities beyond soil cultivation and food production. In other words, this, this slide uh, tells us that peasants are not just cultivators. They're not just uh, tillers of the land. Um, and Elson, in his book in 1997, enumerates these various other acti uh, economic activities fishing, animal husbandry, vegetable farming, tree planting, weaving and dyeing, commerce and trade, carpentry, metal craft and tool making, salt making, wood carving, mining and iron smelting, hunting and foraging. And in the colonial and post-colonial periods, the following developed, boat building, industrial rice and saw milling, brick, tile and lime manufacturing, tailoring, transport business, and various types of off-farm employment, including even full or part-time work in urban areas, as well as uh, phenomenon in the recent years, overseas contract labor. Okay, now so much for the extremely long uh, background and context of this whole issue of the disappearing peasantry. We now go to the uh, point of this lecture. The classical Marxist notion of rural change derives from the view that when capitalism is on the ascendancy, it sweeps aside all previous modes of production and transforms, transforms them into the new mode. In agriculture, this change may take the form of two complementary stages. Number one, the separation, forcibly or otherwise, of the smallholding peasant from the means of production, land and their transformation to either a rural or urban wage-earning proletariat, wage-earning class, that is the proletariat. And the second uh, stage here, which goes along with the first stage, is the, is the concentration of land in the hands of large capitalist farms utilizing wage labor and advanced machinery, where production is purely for profit, thus replacing the small uh, household-run farms. In a nine, 1907 work on the agrarian question, Lenin, in 19, this was, he first wrote this in 1907, but it was published in English in 1976, basically credits capitalist agriculture for ending small-scale production. And he pointed out, the agrarian question very clearly reveals that capitalist agrarian system, the sharply expressed capitalist contradictions in agriculture and livestock farming, the growing concentration of agricultural production, the ousting of small-scale production by large-scale production. Let me, let me repeat that. The ousting of small-scale production by large-scale production 
and the proletarianization and impoverishment of the overwhelming majority of the rural population, quote unquote, from Lenin. But Lenin also, in the development of capitalism in Russia, 1956 English edition, he, he echoed Marx's analysis, but put this within the context of backward and largely underdeveloped Russian agrarian society in the last uh, decade of the 19th century. And this is where he talks about peasant differentiation, uh, which had already taken place in Russia at that time as the social division of labor and agriculture became more pronounced and the peasantry had been divided into three types. The rich, well-to-do peasants, whom he now considers the rural capitalist class. Then you have the middle peasants who, who have an independent existence and are not dependent on uh, the rich peasants. And then lastly, the poor peasants are known. But Lenin calls the poor peasants a rural proletariat. But then there's this fellow, Karl Kautsky. Uh, some of you may be familiar with him, of course, because of Lenin's uh, really vicious uh, polemic against Kautsky in his uh, work, 1920, sorry, 1917, called uh, The Proletarian Revolution and the Renegade Kautsky. But Kautsky was a Marxist, uh, and uh, in this, actually the, the work that I cited earlier by Lenin, uh, called The Great Question and the Critics of Marx, uh, Lenin was actually defending this particular uh, book of Kautsky, The Agrarian Question, against uh, critics that uh, sought to undermine the, the work of Kautsky. So this, is, this was 1899. The, the work of Lenin uh, against Kautsky was published in 1917, where he says Kautsky had already turned renegade. But anyway, uh, Kautsky's work on the agrarian question actually is probably with the same level as uh, Chayanov's work on the uh, theory of peasant economy. And this again was also lost for a while and but was finally translated into English in 1987. Um, for Kautsky, agrarian change takes place with the development of large capitalist farms and their subsequent domination over the small peasant farms. So far, so good. But in his work, The Agrarian Question, Kautsky argues that rather than causing the rapid dissolution of the latter, that is the small farms, a relationship arises whereby the existence of family farms fulfills a necessary function for the large farms. that of providing an adequate supply of cheap labor, according to Alavi, 1987. Profits are maximized by the capitalist farms because they are now freed of responsibility for reproducing the needed labor power, as this is now borne entirely by the peasant household. To continue, uh, the proletarianized peasantry is not disposed of the means of production. So the, that first stage described by uh, classical Marxists in the transformation of agrarian society, that is uh, the forcible other or otherwise uh, separation of the peasant, peasant uh, smallholder peasant from the means of production does not take place uh, according to Kautsky. Um, what takes place, on the other hand, is uh, the small farms are subsumed un under the large farms, even when capitalism in agriculture is now fully blown. The finite nature of land prevents expansion in areas occupied by capitalist agriculture, because land is finite. Only an increase in its activities. The proletarianized peasantry is recruited as wage workers by the large farms. Um, all the peasant households simply do not possess enough land to sustain themselves, so they are forced to sell their labor. For Kautsky, the subsumption of small farms under large farms signifies the full-blown development of capitalist agriculture. 
a peasant household selling labor power to the capitalist farms becomes, quote, a proletarianized household and a component of the capitalist mode of production in agriculture. But the continued cultivation of land is reduced to a household activity. So the peasant farm household uh, situation continues to exist. Um, in the Philippines, uh, studies have shown that many of the so-called wage-earning proletariat, especially in uh, uh, big farms, sugar farms, or even banana farms, in uh, banana export farms in the south, many of the wage-earning proletariat retain access to the land through family ties or through sharecropping and tenant farming, according to the study by Cynthia Banson Bautista in her uh, PhD dissertation in 1984. So this is true even of the labor sector that is considered the most proletarianized in the country. The migrant sugar workers of, of uh, Negros province, which is the province that produces uh, the bulk of sugar, sugar uh, production uh, in the Philippines, uh, who between their seasonal work in sugar haciendas or if some slump in sugar production takes place, continue to cultivate subsistence plots in marginal lands around the plantation or are subsidized by their farming families back home because these are migrant workers. John Larkin, who also did a study of uh, sugar farms, describes an entire peasant household in the 1920s who are conscripted to provide labor for a Philippine sugar plantation who have at their disposal still a, a bit of land and sometimes even farm animals and where division of labor is according to age and gender. Kautsky and actually even Lenin as well separates the process of proletarianization from the process of destruction of pre-capitalist organizations and, and their replacement by capitalist organizations of production. And this also constitutes an important de departure from the Marxist view that the two processes are connected or are tethered together. Um, Kautsky further differs from Marx in two other instances. Number one, the use of the peasant household as a unit of analysis rather than the, the individual. And number two, the analysis that changes in agriculture, particularly in small peasant farms, will be generated not from within, but from without. Not from within peasant societies, but from without peasant societies that is from industry and urban areas. Internal changes within agriculture itself will concern only what farms of different sizes produce, sell and, mag and the magnitude of indebtedness and migration from the countryside, rather than from the size distribution of farms. But following Marx, because you know, he's still considered a, Marx, a Marxist uh, and, Le and uh, Lenin as well, He nevertheless validates the Marxist proposition that in absolute terms, in absolute terms, the peasant population will eventually disappear via a twofold external process of number one, migration by peasant household members to urban areas to join the ranks of the urban proletariat. And number two, the increasing tendency of other family members to engage in non-agricultural non forms of livelihood. But then Kautsky uh, says this will take place over a long period of time. So this leaves open the prospect that the peasantry may not even disappear. Given two related propositions. Number one, in the relations and interactions with external forces, the various forms of appropriation are deemed uh, appropriation and uh, exploitation are deemed to be external to the inner essence and dynamic of peasant existence, which can thus not only survive their demise, but subsequently and consequently flourish, according to Bernstein and Byers, 2000. 
And number two, for Chayanov, peasants are an independent class. They contain an internal logic of peasantness that is essential and therefore unchanging, while the forms of their external relations are variable and contingent. So it is only their external relations that change. But even in conditions where the majority of rural labor is now wage earning and do not own any land, the majority of this group still have access to land through their family ties or through sharecropping and tenant farming and thereby retain their quality of peasantness by virtue of their ties with the peasant form of existence of the rural communities to whom they are still connected. This is according to Harris, 1978. The maintenance of these ties is seen primarily as a form of resistance against being totally dependent on wage earnings for their subsistence. Why? Because of the prevailing conditions of wage labor, whether this be wage labor in the rural areas or wage labor in the urban areas, job insecurity, low wages, seasonal, seasonal labor demand, and the constant threat of uh, unemployment. In the Philippines, capitalist farmers are not emerging from the ranks of the peasantry despite the development of local agricultural labor market in the rice sector and of the capitalist farmers in some areas, according to Cynthia Banson Bautista. Many straddles the line between the self-sufficient smallholder and the rural proletariat, a situation that partly reflects the resistance of peasants to capitalist penetration. As for the impact of liberalization and globalization policies, Eastwood, Lipton, and Newell in 2004 assert that these policies have made negligible inroads into small family farms in developing countries, as the market reforms attached to these development strategies have been slower in agriculture compared to the services sector and the manufacturing sector and tended to favor larger and more capital intensive farms. The liberalization and globalization environment has resulted in the growing role of supermarkets, grades and standards, export horticulture, all of which favor large farms. But all of this also marginalize and screen out family farms from being drawn deeper into the globalized market economy. Marginalization of small farms in this instance under the regime of globalization and liberalization uh, implies that the essential features of peasant communities that are part of this sector will remain generally unchanged. So it would appear that within a global context for small, run, small family run farms and by implication for the peasantry in the greater part of such farms their predicted end is not yet in sight. Okay, so let's look at the present situation in the global uh, the world today. Um, recall that the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization declared 2014 the International Year of Family Farming in order to help raise awareness of the crucial role played by family farmers in fighting hunger and poverty worldwide. More than 90% of the world's 570 million farms are owned and operated by families or an individual and rely primarily on family labor. Most are, are small and are found in the rural areas of the developing world. The Asian continent has 74% of the total family farms. China has 35% China has 35 alone. India has 24% alone. And the rest of Asia, 15%. Family farms occupy 70 to 80% of total farmland. About 72% are smaller than one hectare. 6% are bigger than five hectares. And 22% in other sizes. Statistics uh, released by the UNFAO also show that family farms produce more than 80% of the world's food in value terms and represent collectively the largest source of employment 
worldwide. Family farming is much more than a mode of food production. It is also a way of life, according to the FAO. Now, of course, many of these smallholder family farmers are poor and food insecure and have limited access to markets and services. Their choices are constrained, but they farm their own land and produce food for a substantial proportion of the world's population. Smallholders are concentrated in Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Latin America through farmers, artisans, fisherfolk, pastoralists, landless, and indigenous peoples. They run diversified agricultural systems and preserve traditional food products, contributing both to a balanced diet and the safeguarding of the world's agro-biodiversity. Besides farming, they take on multiple, often informal economic activities to contribute toward their small incomes. Today, there is a need for sustainable agriculture in order to tackle the triple challenge of producing more food, creating more jobs, and preserving the natural resource base. And small family farms lie at the heart of this solution. Now, in the Philippine setting, we have more or less at the micro level a similar situation. 55% of the uh, Philippine population continue to live in rural areas, although this may be declining. Total farmland is 7.3 million hectares, which comprises almost one-fourth of total land area. Uh, the number of farms, 5.6 million farms or farm holdings. But family farms comprise 93.1% of the total farm area or 6.78 million hectares. And the number of farms, uh, family-sized farms are 5.5 million, 98.2% from less than one hectares. The average size of these farms are 1.23 hectares, which, which is a um, uh, reduction from the 1980 uh, average size of 2.8 hectares. By the way, these this, this statistics uh, are all from the latest uh, Philippine Census of Agriculture, which is 2012. Uh, census of Ag Agriculture takes place in the Philippines every 10 years or so. Medium-sized farms, uh, 93,758. Uh, total area, just over 1 million hectares. The large farms, uh, only 578,000 hectares. Um, Ten-year arrangements of family farms, fully owned, 60%, 3.45 million farms, while there's still a considerable amount of uh, farms that are tenanted, nine, almost 1 million farms and uh, 1.3 million hectares, despite uh, a long-running, probably one of the world's long-running uh, uh, land reform or agrarian reform programs dating back to the 1960s. I guess that's, that's it, just... Uh, like we just like to uh, give credit to uh, Federico Boyd Dominguez for these uh, for the paintings of rural life. Those of you who who have read the uh, Journal of Peasant Studies uh, are familiar with the painting of paintings of Boyd Dominguez. Uh, okay, this is just a biography. I won't go through it one by one. And about three or four pages of this. Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Ed, for your presentation. Uh, I'm not going to summarize it. You took about 50 minutes to make your presentation. That's fine. Oh, okay. We can have a, that's okay. We can have a long discussion. In fact, there are two areas he covered. One is theoretically how Marx and Marxists looked at the peasantry as a class. And the second one is the current situation in world production by the small peasant farming with particular attention to Philippine situation. And people can take Sri Lankan situation into their discussion 
So this is open for now, question and comments and observations. Uh, I have a question. Uh, uh, a uh, Professor Ed, thank you very much for the great presentation. Uh, very informative. And I have a very few very basic questions uh, to ask. Uh, uh, how do you? Uh, who are the who are the who are the theoreticians that you categorize as orthodox Marxist? In this, especially regarding uh, the question of peasantry. Are you asking for names? Yeah, <laughs> theoreticians. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know whether I should. <laughs> Maybe I'll pass on that question. <laughs> Okay, uh, some of them are friends of mine and <laughs> might be a bit uh, sensitive. Sure, Sorry. sure. Uh, so, do you, do you consider Marx as a, as an orthodox Marxist? Good question. Um, remember, at some point uh, when he was still alive, and there were there were scholars, activists, revolutionaries uh, calling themselves Marxists. And uh, they were fighting with each other, which provoked Marx into saying, uh, to hell with you, all I know is I'm not a Marxist. Uh, yes and no. Yeah. At some point, he sounds orthodox, but as I pointed out in my presentation, he, at some point, he does not sound orthodox at all. Uh, so maybe that categorization may not apply to Marx himself, because... Uh, like, for example, mode of production. He, he used it in several senses. Mm -hmm. So if you, are, if you consider yourself orthodox or traditional, you can pick out the first two notions of mode of production, which Marx characterizes as simply the relations of production and courses of production. Then you, will, you may be categorized as an orthodox Marxist. Then Marx also used mode of production in different senses. Uh, and uh, the, that, uh, the sense in which he used it, which I personally prefer, is when he used it to refer to the broad organization of society. In other words, not just the economic uh, instance, but also the whole uh, gamut of uh, political, economic, social, cultural aspects of society, which I find, you know, quite unorthodox. <laughs> just, just one last thing. Uh, so you mentioned about uh, the economic determinism, determinism or econo the economic deterministic view of uh, in Marxist, Marxist tradition, especially in Marx himself. Uh, do, do, do you consider yourself uh, being reconciled with the view, like, like some of the uh, people that you mentioned, some of the theories that you mentioned? Which view? Uh, uh, economic determinism. Uh, no, I, I, I do not consider myself an economic determinist. Oh, what what uh, what I would prefer actually is to look at uh, the actual situation, the actual material situation. At times, uh, the economy economic uh, factors may be dominant and determinant. But uh, there are some occasions when uh, it will be the political instance that will be determinant. Uh, and other occasions when even the cultural uh, aspect becomes uh, more determinant over the economic, political. Uh, and then sometimes it's, it's, it's the social aspect that becomes, it, it depends really at what particular conjuncture in history uh, you're talking about. Yeah, I think I asked a slightly di slightly different question. I asked about the, the view of uh, the views of Marx, basically. I mean, people claim, accuse Marx being economically deterministic. Uh, so I think at one point you mentioned about uh, the deterministic view and some people claim that his views are fundamentally deterministic, economic deterministic. So I asked you a comment about that. You're asking if I think Marx is economically, is an economic determinist? Exactly. Uh, I don't think so. 
one one has to read the whole of Marx rather than just one or two or three uh, of his writings because uh, his, his views were actually changing, constantly changing. If you look at the young Marx, you know he was more concerned about uh, you know this whole issue of alienation, which is an extremely uh, philosophical uh, question. But then as the years went by, he became more uh, concerned with uh, the economic instance. Uh, but, uh, but then when he starts talking about the revolution, it would appear that now the political instance has, has become more uh, deter determined. And just to, just to show you that uh, Marx's views uh, changed throughout time, uh, his original concept of the peasantry, which was actually quite, uh, it, didn't look, it didn't look too well at the peasantry, called it a sack of potatoes, uh, non-revolutionary, that it will always have to be guided by outsiders, and that it will always have to play second fiddle to the, to the proletariat, and so forth and so on. Towards the end of his life, if you, if you note the, when he started to look at the Russian peasantry, mm -hmm. and looked at the phenomenon of the Semstvo, these are the communal uh, farms in, in Russia. And he wrote about this in, uh, in, the, in the preface to the Russian edition of the Communist Manifesto. He pointed out uh, that uh, oh, this is great, you know, the Zemsbo uh, uh, situation of communal farms will make it possible for Russia to uh, go straight to socialism sure. and not having to go through a capitalist uh, Mode of production. He was so, very so by that time, he's, sure. yeah. Yeah. when he wrote to Vera, the comrade Vera, that he was very particular about that issue, the potential that carried by the peasantry and uh, those farm structures. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Jenny? <laughs> Uh, um, can yes. I have a hi. question? Uh, um, hi. Um, sorry, I, I couldn't participate from the beginning for this meeting. And I would like to ask Aid, uh, thank you very much for your um, presentation. Um, in this situation, uh, current situation in Philippines, uh, how would you think that uh, the patients and uh, proletariat patients becoming more and more poorer than becoming? Um, come into the uh, middle class or even um, labor position. So by uh, multinational companies um, subsumes all the uh, area of uh, farms, of family farms, would it be a progressive front uh, steps towards uh, developing Philippines or would it be um, make, making any uh, disturbances. What would you think about uh, compared to the new um, current situation in Philippines? You're, you're, are you are you talking about the revolutionary potential of the Philippine um, peasantry? No, just at the moment, considering uh, current situation, uh, step by step, uh, I think um, peasantry's uh, farming becoming poorer and uh, rather becoming a stable situation according to globalization. So. The companies, multinational company, national companies, uh, invading for the farmers' lands, step by step, even going to happen in Sri Lanka as well. So, it, would it be a progressive uh, steps compared to uh, global situation, especially farmers becoming uh, workers, laborers? Well, it's hard to say, you know. Uh... It's hard to say because of the type of capitalist development that is uh, happening in the Philippines and many other developing countries, you know, this is this is not uh, this is not your progressive quote unquote type of capitalism that uh, Marx wrote about, where where he even uh, hailed the you know the progressive uh, role of the bourgeoisie in in, uh, in global in historical development because. Uh, it developed the forces of production and it enabled uh, uh, the peasants to be freed from the land and become uh, the proletariat. And the proletariat for him 
uh, is the you know is, is the harbinger of the new society, the socialist society, that only the proletariat can carry a socialist line. Type of capitalism that is uh, happening in, in the world today, in most of the world today, is a very backward, uh, dependent type of capitalism. It is not based on industrial production. It is not based on uh, manufacturing of uh, development of capital goods. It, does, it is not based on developing a stable uh, army of, of uh, proletariat who are forever wedded to the, to the factory or to the plantation. You know? uh, it is a type of capitalism that is uh, extremely, that breeds uh, more poverty, more inequality. Uh, it is based on the development of the, on the, on the service sector mainly not manufacturing, not even uh, capitalist agriculture. It is also based on uh, f financialization, a, fin uh, a bloated financial sector. Uh, in the Philippines, you also have a bloated uh, uh, information technology sector, mainly call centers. Uh, and it's also based on the global need for, uh, for Filipino migrant workers. Uh, you have 10 million Filipinos working abroad as migrant workers in capitalist countries uh, and uh, actually provide the, uh, uh, keeps the, the economy afloat, you know, that, that, that is the kind of, and even though even the proletariat by itself in the Philippines is, is not your, you know, it's not your classical proletariat. Uh, these are probably, I would call them uh, to use the, uh, to use uh, a current uh, concept I would call them the precariat class rather than a proletariat class because they're, they're, they don't have security of tenure. Most of them are contractual workers. Uh, um, they can be fired anytime. Uh, and, then, and then you also have a very a huge informal sector. Probably half of the Filipino working class are in the informal sector. These are informal workers, vendors, uh, uh, self-employed uh, uh, workers and so forth and so on. So, you know, given that type of capitalist development, you know, I, I wouldn't call it a progressive uh, kind of, uh, of uh, development that would lead to some kind of uh, full-blown capitalist development in the, in the classic sense of the American and European, Western European type of capitalist development. And uh, it only impoverishes further uh, the working classes of, uh, of Philippine society. There's a question by Jerry. Where, I, I will read it. Where will Marx and Lenin put the role of cyber workers in building the proletariat power when they lack the base of collective consciousness? Shall I read oh, it? I, I read it, but I don't really understand it. <laughs> um, cyber workers, are, are you referring, is, is this uh, in reference to call center agents? Uh, I think probably, like? yes. Sorry? Yes? I think that may be the, yeah. Uh, Mm. Uh, uh, if Jerry is, if Jerry is uh, online, maybe he can elaborate on this question. Right now, what 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 do you mean by cyber workers? Information. Okay, information. Uh, so that's right. Can... So call center agents, uh, among them, that is, uh, but probably also those engaged in uh, uh, developing software. Uh, which, by the way, does not exist in the Philippines, but is probably more prominent in Bangalore, in uh, in India, uh, and also in the uh, migrant workers in uh, Silicon Valley in, in California. Uh, so the assumption here from Jerry's question is that they lack collective consciousness. I'm not. It's possible. I'm not sure that. Uh, I guess I would agree that they lack collective consciousness because the uh, 
the turnover rates of uh, information tech workers is extremely fast uh, because the, the type of work that they're engaged in is extremely uh, stressful, uh, mentally challenging, because all they get are complaints and uh, they're, they're always sore and a lot by those who call them up. And um, I know this for a fact because I have students who work as uh, call center agents and according to them, the average uh, uh, term of employment is only about six months. Um, in other words, they can only last six months. It is not that they, 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 are get, they get fired, but after six months, they, they just leave. So there's really no time for them to develop uh, collective consciousness. Although while they are working, you know, they, they have some kind of collective consciousness. They uh, eat together, they take their lunches together, they uh, take their breaks together, and so forth. And, but probably that's, that doesn't really work much. And then the, the other issue here, of course, is uh, the issue of, uh, of trade unions or labor unions. Most uh, companies engaged in this type of work uh, expressly prohibit the formation of trade unions, of labor unions, uh, or they are exempted from uh, government, uh, because call centers in the Philippines are part of what are called uh, special economic zones. And special economic zones are exempted from uh, labor regulations and many other rules that uh, are meant to protect the rights of workers. So in that way, uh, you know, I, I would tend to agree with Jerry that cyber workers uh, may not be the place to look for. Uh, I mean, uh, I, the information technology companies may not be the place to look for if you're looking for a proletariat that can form a collective consciousness that can uh, bring about uh, socialist society or any other non-capitalist society. Okay. Any questions? I have the floor. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, I'm very glad to hear the presentation of, of Ed because this is the first time I've, I've encountered uh, the peasantry as a social, as a distinct social class. And the, the reason is because uh, I think what Marx missed out on is the fact that we all have to eat and machines will not feed us, software will not feed us. In other words, the, develop, the historical development, the historical and political development did not develop along the lines of subsistence, but developed along the lines of uh, uh, capital growth. And so it is so very important to, that we still have this family, family household uh, units who can, uh, who can supply the food, food for the world. Uh, there, may, there may be some truth to the fact that the poor will always be with us, as in the Bible says. Because no matter how poor they are, at least they eat and they live. And maybe they are happier. There, there may not be a lot of progress there. There may not be a lot of uh, uh, social development there, but I can see a value in that kind of uh, community life. And especially in these times of uh, environmental degradation where, where uh, cultivation of natural food is so important and the destruction of the environment. 
is uh, is is frowned upon. I I see that as a as maybe a contribution to the to the to the theories of uh, historical development uh, globally, especially since globalization is in crisis. When you say globalization, and and that and that the the most of the wealth are in the 0.01 percent of the population. So uh, I, I value the 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 the, the essence of uh, the presentation, and we must look into that in terms of the food sustainability the world over. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Jenny. Any other questions? Maybe, uh, if, if I may add a little bit more <laughs> to my presentation and bring it to the current, current year, uh, the year of COVID-19, the year of the pandemic. Uh, what is happening now uh, in the Philippines is that uh, uh, food, food production, and even food entering the market is now even becoming more dependent on uh, small family farms. And uh, because agricultural production hasn't really been affected by the pandemic, so the small family farms continue to produce food, vegetables, uh, fruits, uh, fish, um, nutritious uh, food, uh, if I may say so. And uh, the problem now is how to get that food that they produce to the uh, to the to the households where where uh, and so a number of civil society organizations have taken on this task of uh, becoming quote unquote middlemen, but not not middlemen in the sense of the exploitative middlemen, but in uh, uh, bringing the food from uh, produced by small farms to certain areas in the cities and some and where you can pick up pick them up uh, in public places or they sometimes deliver food to uh, to households and uh, and so, some of these are actually even food produced by indigenous communities in far flung areas and then they are, and i'm amazed at the abundance of food that they are able to produce uh, uh, even under uh, covid-19 times so the importance of the peasantry in the form of small family farms becomes even more important now in this time of uh, the pandemic, especially in uh, uh, addressing the question of uh, hunger. Hunger is, is increasing. Uh, many people are growing hungry, especially in, in the urban areas here in Metro Manila. Uh, there, there was this... Uh, something I, I saw on Facebook of families uh, offering to barter their appliances or, or their uh, whatever they have in their house for food. And uh, it really, you know, really, really is quite uh, telling that, that, that situation. And of course, this under phenomenon. Yes, Jenny. Excuse me. I think we can also appreciate the the grab the grab deliveries or the oh, yeah. movement of mm. food. Okay. Any more questions or even some views and observations? Hello. Yeah, Ridley. Uh, <clears throat> um, I appreciate your presentation very much. Uh, uh, except, just have one one question regarding the Marxist uh, uh, or the Marxist whole approach beginning from Marx. 
uh, to this um, the question of you're talking about now. This is say that <clears throat> you know, Kautsky said so that the percentage is never going to disappear. So it is uh, <clears throat> through the historical processes that's been sort of subsumed uh, within uh, the, the historical formation. And now <clears throat> my my have a sort of question about Marx's approach about the uh, on the uh, the concept of contradictions within the Hegel, Hegelian dialectics, whether that has played a role in his in his analysis that the Marxist Marxian method was to overcome the contradictions. So, in overcoming contradictions, which um, uh, basically uh, uh, the historical development of capitalism was a destruction of or sweeping away of other modes of production, right? So that is how Marx has developed his theory of capitalist development as a as process of destroying other contradictions, and then capital is overcoming other modes of production. But when you compare this with um, the Hegelian concept of contradiction, which is not a, it doesn't end in overcoming contradiction, but in the cons you know, this, you know, reconciliation of contradiction within the whole. So this is what I think that is, that is what, we, what has been happening in, 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 the, in, the, real, in, in the reality. Uh, it's a not, not a progressive development of history. So like Hegel's call it sublation of contradiction within the whole. So is this not what has been happening? And has Marx been wrong in in uh, standing Hegel on his on his head, or do we need to go back to the concept of reconciliation rather than overcoming of contradictions to to uh, get a real understanding of the uh, historical development of, of, of social policy? Do you have anything to say on that? Ed? <laughs> okay. Um, I don't think there has been any reconciliation of the contradiction. Uh, if, uh, if one goes through the whole uh, length of human history, where the peasantry has been uh, a primary player or actor, uh, that contradiction has been quite intense and oftentimes violent. Uh, and you know, just just the whole gamut of peasant rebellions, peasant unrest uh, throughout history, uh, which sometimes caused the toppling of uh, empires and uh, states, uh, uh, resulting in regime changes. Most of this have been uh, peasant-based, uh, peasant-based uh, revolutionary activities. Um, and uh, the objective is to uh, assert, you know, their, their rights, their dignity, their uh, sovereignty as, as a class vis-a-vis uh, -vis those who wish to uh, exploit them. Uh, and then, of course, aside from, aside from full-blown peasant rebellions and peasant revolutions that have taken place throughout all human history. Uh, you have what uh, Shainin and uh, James Scott calls everyday forms of resistance. Resistances that take place every day in the lives of peasant households and how they resist. Uh, and uh, in that sense, really try to uh, resolve the contradiction in their own way. By, uh, and the intention is to come on top Go to, go to end up on top of the situation uh, against uh, those who would wish to continue to exploit and oppress them and uh, violate, violate their sense of human dignity and, and justice and fairness. So there has been no reconciliation at all. I, I don't think so. Well, uh, I don't want to continue in this uh, in argument with you, but 
I mean reconciliation, not not like uh, the the concept of peaceful coexistence. The con contradictions uh, within contradictions. So there there would be transformations of contradictions, right? So the reconciliation is not a closed circle; it's an open circle in the Hegelian sense. So there are there are room there is room for possibilities within the contradiction that that would uh, eventually transform the whole. That is what I mean by reconciliation, not sort of, you know, we live in peace. It's all the contradiction here. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, granted. Uh, but of course, in the, to differentiate Marx from Hegel, Hegel was an idealist and uh, everything was happening in the ideal world, uh, absolute and all that, where Marx was a materialist. Uh, that was a very basic distinction, I think, between the two. Uh, Ridley, can I ask a question from you? Yeah. Uh, what do you mean by, uh, I mean, how, 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 how would you say that uh, the Hegelian dialectic, the dialectics is much more relevant to understand the present context than the Marxian dialectics? What is your foundation? What is your... Yeah, well, this is more of a separate discussion, but I think that Hegelian dialectic is, is more emancip emancipatory than Marxist. So, um, that is my basic proposition. Really Hegelian dialectic in more contradiction um, that is that gives room for possibilities of transformation. Whereas, what for example, what happened with the Russian Revolution was they overcame contradictions, and then uh, use they had to use violence in order to you know forcefully collectivize uh, the peasantry, so that they did the they externalized the contradictions, right? But the contradiction must be seen within as an internal process. That is what I think Hegelian concept was. So in that sense, I think Hegel should have been, should have come after Marx uh, rather than the other way around. So um, I'm prepared to discuss this <laughs> at a later stage, but not yeah, now. We can, yeah. we can have another, discussion on that particular issue probably in future yeah we should yeah. because i think we have to carefully carefully understand and, uh, sure we can focus our discussion today on peasantry peasantry as a class uh let me ask a question well i have here two questions the question number one which is an extension of kalpa's question and you answer also. What I'm thinking is, actually, Marx became from orthodox Marxist to heterodox Marxist in his later years. All Marx, all in maybe inverted commas, quote unquote. He was an orthodox Marxist, but especially when he started reading the situation in Russia particular, and to a certain extent in India and China, through second-hand readings, then he in fact uh, started reading in Russian language. In fact, his wife complained that uh, Marx is trying to read Russia just thinking that it's a life and death question. He, she wrote to Engels. So I think he became a very heterodox Marxist. Uh, probably uh, had he written some of his writings after this Russian literature, reading Russian literature, he might have changed some of the ideas that he ho held uh, before that. That's a, one observation. The second thing is peasantry as a class. Uh, have you come across the writings of uh, Jairus Banaji, mm. yeah. uh, who very recently wrote a book on mercantile uh, merchant capitalism and wrote something on peasantry as well, in which he argued part of the peasantry can be actually defined as proletarian in the sense 
that they integrated into, if you look at the Grundrisse, mm. in one place, Grundrisse, Marx argued, or the Marx defined proletariat. Deviating from the traditional traditional definition that uh, those who are working, those who are selling their labor power kind of thing, he said labor or the proletariat can be defined as a set, as a capital generating labor, either directly or indirectly. So I think Banaji argued, especially referring to the Deccan peasantry in India in the colonial period, in the British period, he said that particular group of peasants became in fact proletarianized uh, uh, through the merchant capital, uh, integration through the merchant capital. And similar thing can be seen, especially in uh, uh, sugarcane production, even in Sri Lanka and probably in Philippines. I think what you expressed in relation to Philippines actually exists the same way in Sri Lanka. Uh, there are, they are small farmers. They work on their plot and work for the company. And also they work in the company's land. So like that, uh, it's very uh, complicated issue as far as the peasantry is concerned. Now, the, my second question is, if peasantry is becoming gradually proletarianized in different ways, should we accept the theory that the urban proletariat will lead the revolution, revolutionary process? Uh, that's the classical Marxist standpoint. Are we going to accept that as it is today uh, with this new development and the globalization? Very interesting, uh, Sumana. I, uh, I, of course, I know the Janus, Jairus uh, Banaji, but I haven't seen his uh, the work that you uh, cited about. Uh, the proletarianization of the peasantry due to the intervention of merchant capitalism. But... Uh, it's in Economic and Political Weekly. Okay, yeah, we, I, I don't I have a subscription send, I to... Send, I can send I don't you. have a subscription to Economic and Political Weekly, but lately we've, we've subscribed to it already. So hmm. it, maybe there will be a lot of catching up to do with EPW. Uh, Okay. I think uh, regarding your, I, I basically I agree with your first point of Marx's transformation from being quote unquote an, 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 an orthodox to becoming more heterodox. And I think uh, Engels uh, played a, a great role here in, uh, in expanding Marx's uh, universe particularly uh, Engels' work on uh, the conditions of the English working class uh, gave Marx the empirical, the empirical data that would uh, fortify his argument of the exploitation of the, the working class. Uh, and the collaboration between the two made Marx probably less and less orthodox and more and more unorthodox. And, 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 and also, of course, of course, as you pointed out, Sumimi, when he started looking at the Russian uh, situation and also the Indian the situation in India, and he wrote a little bit about this, uh, particularly when he was a correspondent for the New York uh, for a New York newspaper, uh, and from here he he was talking of different types of mode of production, including on the Asiatic Asiatic mode of production, which is based on uh, uh, control of water rather than control of land, uh, especially in Southeast Asia. And the most prominent example of this, of course, is uh, the, um, the temple economies of uh, Cambodia. And uh, so, yeah, in that sense, I would agree. Now, about the transformation of the peasantry, into a proletariat, uh, I, I, I pointed that out in my presentation. But uh, my caveat to that, of course, is to point out that 
they are not completely proletarianized in the traditional orthodox sense because they maintain their links with uh, with uh, their kinship kinship links with their families in the rural areas or in in small family farms so uh, as, as a means of uh, as a means of uh, protecting themselves in case they lose their jobs they get fired uh, or the production in in uh, the uh, capitalist farm uh, suffers a, uh, a downturn due to whatever globalization crisis economic crisis and all that uh, and and i think this 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 uh, this development is is is, is good it's progressive because somehow uh, the peasantry is able to relate with uh, the conditions of the, the proletariat and able to understand uh, the situation outside peasant society. Uh, and that, that uh, sort of broadens uh, the peasant's uh, worldview in that sense, while not totally, while, not, uh, while continuing to you know, exhibit uh, traits and characteristics, uh, as well as worldviews of uh, the peasant class, uh, and so th this is where I pointed out about the articulation of modes of production, uh, articulation and coexistence of uh, modes of production. Now, as to whether this particular transformation will mean uh, rethinking the concept of the industrial proletariat as the leading uh, class or the urban proletariat as the leading class that would bring about uh, the new society, the socialist society. Um, this is something that we should seriously think about, especially given the fact that uh, your industrial proletariat is, is, is extremely small uh, in developing countries like the Philippines and probably even in India. Or Southeast Asia and many other developing societies in the world today. So uh, the smallness of their uh, size would work against there being, uh, you know, a may, uh, the the the, the to dominant force in, in 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 revolutionary change. And uh, so so yeah yeah so there you have it. Uh, plus the fact that even the industrial proletariat small as it is, 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 uh, is a precarious class. But their, their situation is not permanent, it's not stable, and uh, they get fired. Uh, the, most of them are actually contractual workers. No security of tenure, no benefits, and so forth and so on. And this is one reason why they continue to maintain links with the rural areas, with their families who are still in the rural areas who sometimes even provide them with food, send food to them in, in the urban areas just to replenish their, uh, their, their basic needs. Professor, you have, your mic is mute, I think. Anyone wants to ask a question in Sinhala, we can translate it into English. Either Kalpo, I can do. Or Ridley. Uh, so don't uh, take language as a barrier to enter into the discussion. Uh, any other thing? Do you have anything, Kalpa? Uh, I like to share this uh, small passage from Marx's Capital. Uh, this is chapter 27. Uh, the expropriation of the agricultural population from the land. I think this will help uh, the discussion to develop furthermore. And people, I, I would like to encourage people to read actual Marx and you will see that how uh, dialectical and how, how uh, descriptive, how empirical he is about these, these social changes. In chapter 27, he mentions something like this. Uh, the wage laborers of agriculture were partly peasants who made us of their leisure time by working on the large states and partly an independent special class of wage laborers, relatively and absolutely few in numbers. The latter were also in uh, practice peasants farming independently for themselves. 
since in addition to their wages, they were provided with arable land to extend of four or more acres together with their cottages. So I think uh, as, as Professor Lienig has correctly mentioned, also Jairus Manaji argues in his work that how, how, how peasants identify themselves at the same time while doing agricult agricultural activities, they were partly involved in wage labor, uh, wage labor. And they always maintain this balance as, as, as securing themselves from the uh, capitalist growth dynamics. So it's very important to un understand and not categorizing them as, as a very uh, passive class. They know what's going on. They, un they understand the economic dynamism and they understand uh, their strength as a class, as a collective. So that aspect is, I think, we have to uh, we have to highlight even in the Sri Lankan context, where agricultural community became a major part of the vote base, and how the uh, right wing politicians uh, mobilized them in the in the electoral politics. So we have to understand that aspect uh, very correctly in, in political when it, when it comes to politics. Any other comments? Um, I would like to tell um, Karpa, in Sri Lankan patients, actually, they are going through the very, very backwardness compared to other countries, especially developed countries. So in one way, um, becoming more and more um, labors of any other big companies, that at least it, it could help them for becoming or come out of from their um, a uh, small uh, group or small mentality and nationalistic um, habits and culture. Uh, because compared in other countries like in New Zealand, I have seen um, small uh, peasants, actually they are uh, working under uh, big companies and farming uh, farmers becoming actually more established here, even small, uh, a uh, small group of uh, farmers, they are very uh, stable uh, because they're linked with under big companies and a lot of uh, labors, they are stable because their labor wages compared to other countries, it's very, very um, high. And then um, they ask, um, their conditions is uh, actually in stable conditions and uh, in that situation, they are very uh, not in the other uh, developing countries, uh, patients and not uh, backwardness. So they are very forward, and they they are um, they are uh, ability to protest, ability to uh, fight with the uh, state or whatever the uh, coming from. Um, limit their rights, they are very uh, organized. So in that situation, um, I think it's better if we have such situation like in Sri Lanka, because Sri Lankan present, especially for the um, small groups and especially um, very rural areas, they are very poor. And they are always try to depend on uh, some politicians or some other cultural uh, elements or other some uh, backbenders, uh, they are, um, uh, some ethnic background, so like something like that. That could be very hard to get that, them out of their um, the situation and uh, bring them into um, class struggle. Actually, they are away from class struggle. They don't feel that they are having these problems. Day to day, they are exploited by other some uh, companies, some other uh, mediators, such as uh, businessmen. Uh, selling them their fertilizers and such as. So that could be very, very, very uh, um, hard situation for them to come out from that. Therefore, I think uh, if, if they have the chance to get, go um, under any big companies or becoming uh, laborers under there, they, 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 they have some uh, good um, chance for think themselves. They are now they are not just themselves uh, poor farmers, they becoming laborers like that. Okay. Anybody else?
Yeah, I think uh, what Ranjana said, I think it would be helpful to say these things because this may be somewhat relevant to the Philippine situation as well. Uh, the question is, now most of the, even Rajana's question, most of the people argue, I mean many people argue that uh, peasant should be modernized, peasant or their agricultural work should be modernized. By the word modernize, they assume the so-called capitalistic development. But in villages, even in Sri Lanka, in fact today Kirti is not here, there is a movement that peasants should go for a zero-cost agriculture. Zero-cost agriculture, which is against this modernized, so-called modernized agriculture based on chemical fertilizer and chemical fertilizer and pesticides. Because in India, number of, number of farmers, peasants actually, they experimented this zero cost agriculture very successfully. I mean, it's a very integrated agriculture. Uh, it should include not only farming, but also livestock production. So it's a very integrated system. So therefore, there is a movement in Sri Lanka that people should go for this zero cost agriculture system, which is which may look as a very regressive from the modernist perspective. But at the same time, it will generate a new kind of agricultural movement that may even help to find a new kind of collectivization, not collectivization of Russian kind that happened in 1930s, 40s, but a, some kind of collectivization, sort of uh, sharing labor, marketing, some kind of cooperative system, that kind of system. So I think in Sri Lanka, probably maybe in Philippines, because I visited one village, uh, I don't remember the name of that village. I think it's a Latifundia by Ramos. Ramos, one big landlord. Uh, so I went to that village and they had, they captured the land and now growing uh, kind of integrative system of agriculture. So I think we should not think that's a backward or repressive move. Because it is against this kind of capitalist exploitative system. So I think how we should, how we, I mean, how the revolutionaries should look at this kind of agrarian issues and questions and movements and resistance, I think it's important even for a Marxist to think differently about the present uh, resistance. Excuse me, I'll ask questions. Yes, yes, Malak. Yeah. Right. yeah. Then, um, according to that presentation, also mentioned very clearly, 80% uh, of uh, farm products come from a small scale uh, agriculture uh, farm. Uh, at the same time, you know that under nine, uh, COVID 19, that uh, pandemic situation, uh, many countries, almost all countries in the world, uh, they depend mainly, uh, they produce themselves. That means agriculture dependencies uh, now everywhere we can see in the world. But uh, according to data, it shows that poverty level uh, increasing under that COVID-19 situation. Then that's a contradiction because uh, agriculture producers produce large number of products and now uh, many countries uh, 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 their agriculture dependency also very high, but that income distribution uh, or something happen in the uh, each country, then uh, it's a wonder uh, for, uh, why this kind of situation is still happening. Uh, this is uh, my question. I don't know. Can you understand it or not very clearly? Yeah. 
Yeah, the your question is that although agricultural production has increased during the COVID nineteen yeah period, yeah dependency yeah and distribution yeah. Uh, is uh, uh, unfavorable for the uh, behaved A and small scale yeah producers. So how do we explain? How do you explain that? Yeah, yeah. in present countries. Yeah. Anything? This is basically, I think, is it only Sri Lankan situation, or you are referring to the global? No, I I, I mentioned that global situation because uh, yeah, many yeah. report says that uh, poverty situation and uh, no poverty population uh, getting increase after that COVID uh, nineteen situation. Any response? Uh, Ed. Have you mute? mute. Oh. Yeah, I, I understand the point that is being made by uh, Malaka, uh, but it is not really a, not really a contradiction, because uh, while while small family farms contribute eighty percent of food production, uh, it only means that uh, they could actually do much more. They could do much more in improving the uh, their practices, not not necessarily in terms of uh, modernization, as uh, Suma may have pointed out, in, in the sense of being more capital oriented, uh, being more dependent on uh, imported uh, uh, chemical uh, fertilizers and inputs and pesticides, and uh, relying on the so-called uh, High yielding variety seeds that are produced by uh, transnational agribusiness corporations like Cargill and the like, but actually using their own uh, their own uh, methods, their own methods of farming. Uh, and, and, and I think this is one this is one distinction that has been made by agrarian scholars that the peasant mode of farming is something that can be stable, that can be productive, that can be sustainable, and is more uh, protective of, of nature, of the environment, of the ecology of, uh, of the rural areas. Uh, so it doesn't mean that that has to be transformed into something else. It only means that what they have now has to be further developed. Uh, the, in terms of uh, making them more, uh, how should I put it, improve their quality of life so that they are able to meet their basic needs. When you say, when we are saying that they they produce 80% of, the, of uh, the food needs of the global population, uh, it doesn't really, it doesn't mean that they are able to meet all of their basic needs. Uh, especially in terms of uh, social needs, education, housing, uh, basic social services, which uh, are actually the responsibility of the state, and not their main responsibility. This is where the state has been remiss in its duties to the uh, to its citizens, um, and and the fact that their their uh, their poverty and their uh, lack of uh, economic and political power is merely a reflection of uh, the way external society has treated them while continuing to depend on them for food production. So this is something that even the UNFAO is seeking to address, you know, these conditions of subjugation, uh, exploitation and oppression of the peasantry while uh, depending on them for the, or your, food, uh, your food needs. So the, the question of poverty in this sense should also be seen in a relative sense. You know? uh, they may be poor in terms of uh, basic needs, but they are not, they're not growing hungry because they produce their own food needs. So at least that is something that, uh, that, is something that uh, non-peasants don't have, uh, that, that uh, particular privilege and opportunity. So... Uh, Basically, what I'm saying really is that uh, recognition of the role of the peasantry in providing for the food needs of the global world's population 
also means uh, recognizing the role of external actors, especially the state, in providing for the other needs of peasant society, which they themselves cannot uh, uh, fulfill, especially in terms of education, uh, basic health services, and other social services, including uh, uh, potable water, um, uh, stable uh, and, and cheap power supply, and, and all other basic services. Oh, there is a question by Ruan. Uh, the question is to Professor Tatum, can you speak on the role of colonialism in the development of conditions of the peasantry in the colonial and semi-colonial world today? You can get the message. Okay, this, this might, might need another lecture. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, well, just just very briefly, definitely uh, the role of colonialism is uh, is been long recognized in terms of uh, uh, being the probably the major, if not uh, the most dominant uh, social, political, and economic and military force that has impinged on peasant societies and rendered them. Uh, uh, objects of exploitation and oppression. Uh, this has been amply documented in, in many, of, in, in almost all colonial, colon, colonized societies in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And uh, yeah, it needs a more uh, yeah, longer discussion, but for now, that is how I would answer this question. Right, thanks. Uh, there's a room for one more question. Uh, just one question about Philippines, because I, I, I know very little about Philippines. Uh, what are the resistance movements in Philippines right now? Well, the longest running resistance movement is the communist movement, uh, especially the, the one that was uh, the, because there are two communist parties in the Philippines. Uh, one is the older one, which has been in place since 1930s. But in 1967, there was a major split in that party. And uh, what came about was another communist party, which was which called themselves uh, a, a Marxist-Leninist Mao Zedong Thought Party, while the other party was retained, was supposed to be pro-Soviet, but that's not quite actually accurate. Well, that older party has, has practically uh, disappeared from the scene. So what we have now, uh, since the 1960s, is the uh, the Maoist uh, type uh, communist party using Maoist uh, type uh, revolutionary strategies of surrounding the cities from the countryside, of protracted war, of uh, relying on the peasantry as uh, the main force of the revolution. Um, this was its strongest point was during the 1980s, the late 1970s and the 1980s, especially when uh, the Philippines was under martial law. But uh, after the toppling of, of uh, the dictator Marcos in 1986, that that uh, communist party uh, underwent a transformation. Also, was racked by splits uh, within its ranks. Um, so its its influence has been quite diminished, but it's still there. It's still uh, doing the Maoist type of rebellion up in the hills and countryside, mm -hmm. uh, but also doing work in the cities. Um, so that that is probably the main uh, resistance group in the country today. And then down south, there is of course the Muslim uh, the Muslim rebellions which have been taking place uh, much longer uh, than the, the communist rebellions, uh, revolutions that we have had. But uh, the biggest of that has entered into a, an agreement with the government and uh, in return for which uh, uh, that uh, Moro uh, Islamic Liberation Front or MILF is now uh, has become, now become uh, legalized and legitimate. 
and is, is at the head of an autonomous uh, government in, in the south, which is due to become a uh, uh, fully functioning autonomous region uh, two years from now, but is in a transition period. Uh, there are other fringe groups uh, like uh, uh, fundamentalist Islamic groups in the south, very small, more than 100 or 200 of them, but from time to time they initiate uh, bombings of cities and kill people, including churches and all that. But as a, as a force, uh, not, not much uh, in terms of uh, being able to influence the situation. Uh, there are also other initiatives you know, that take place uh, mostly in the legal sector. Uh, uh, parliamentary types of groups, uh, political parties that are left-wing, uh, born out of the struggles of the past. Uh, uh, the group I belong to, for example, it's called Labana Masa, People's Fight, which is headed by Walden Bellio. Uh, so we are a socialist coalition composed of several uh, political organizations, uh, but we work you know, above ground. Right. Thanks. Uh, could you just add one thing now? In Sri Lanka, one of the maybe contributory, maybe not contributory factor is uh, NGOization of the left movement. I know NGOs are very strong in Philippines, and we once we had a chat on that. So, how would NGO contribute to impacted on the left movement in Philippines? Positive or negative or neutral? It depends on which, uh, you know, the NGO community is quite diverse. There are tens of thousands of NGOs. Uh, but on the other hand, there are groups of NGOs that are somehow linked or connected with uh, left-wing organizations. Uh, of various uh, shades and various uh, types of uh, uh, left-wing tendencies. Uh, so they, they are the ones that are pushing for, uh, you know, not just, not just reforms, but also basic changes, systemic changes in Philippine society. Uh, and uh, they're quite significant, uh, whether this be... Uh, uh, and, and, and many of them are issue-oriented, um, NGOs on debt, on women, on uh, senior citizens, on the urban poor, who do organizing work among workers, and also NGOs that support the initiatives of peasant organizations in the countryside. So they act as uh, some kind of support, support groups for basic, uh, basic sectors like workers, peasants, um, urban poor, indigenous peoples, uh, the youth, uh, and so forth and so on. So the only problem with these um, NGOs is that they are very dependent on funding, foreign funding. Okay. Uh, so that, that, that can be a problem at times. And some of them actually disappear because the foreign funding had been uh, had right on. disappeared. Okay, thank you very much. And thank Ed for very lucid presentation on peasantry, bringing Marxist theory and also the current situation in the global scene. Uh, our next uh, English Mark School will be on 17th October by Professor Achin Vanayak from India. Actually, be I, I know, I know him. <laughs> Not him, yeah. Um, uh, he's, a fun, he's a funny guy. He tells a lot of jokes. <laughs> yeah, we organized this uh, Mark School in English to connect revolutionaries and kind of people who are uh, working for systemic transformation in South Asia and Southeast Asia together. So I think that's why we invite uh, academic from Philippines, Singapore, Malaysia, and many, many other countries, and also India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. 
so what that's is, what is his topic uh, so I mean, topic is on thing? indian nationalism secularism that kind of thing mm. uh, about especially modi regime regime of uh, narendra's this modi uh, prime minister and its impact on the indian society and before that we have on 26th in single mark school on zero cost uh, industrialization of agriculture versus zero cost agriculture by kirti and then october 3rd on by ranjan comparison of althusa and gramsci more theoretical kind of thing by ranjan so these are the things and i thank once again pro uh, for it uh, tatum for making a beautiful presentation and uh, whenever you free we hope to listen to you once again and with that again thank you very much uh, i will send banaji's article on it's called kautsky lenin and shaino oh okay <laughs> good uh, thank you yeah. uh, Uh, it's a very interesting article, especially in relation to Deccan Pesan during the British colonial period. Uh, with that note, I will uh, conclude this session. Thank you again, and uh, we'll meet again soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. Thank you, Sumame, for organizing this. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Okay. uh